Can I start? <laughs> yes. The next speaker is uh, Philip uh, Chila. Uh, Philip is an uh, expert in uh, security and infrastructure. And uh, Philip will be talking about the uh, Open Web Application Security Project Cloud Native Application Security <laughs> Top 10. They're getting worse. Yeah. <laughs> It's only getting longer and longer. Uh, all right, so, uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Philip Hilla. Uh, I'm a cloud security shepherd. Take it what, for what you want uh, at uh, Xibia. So thank you to my employer for letting me to be here, letting me be here today. So, um, yeah, today, whoop, I would like to start there. So, Quick contact details, uh, briefly about myself. Uh, yeah, I started building data centers. Uh, so I, security, why does defense have to be X amount from the wall? Uh, then how to build uh, basically cages for high security areas with pressure sensors, with tourniquets, so you cannot bring out more than you, so you don't weigh uh, on the way out more that, than you uh, did on the way in. And then I moved uh, to application and infrastructure security, uh, what we used to do with firewalls, uh, switches, routers, so we are run-of-the-mill network security. Then I moved uh, to a cloud service provider um, uh, to help insurance companies uh, secure their infrastructures. Uh, and uh, I work for trading companies. Very interesting world, if you're ever interested, I would definitely uh, recommend looking up how trading companies secure their networks while remaining uh, quick. And now I ended up at Xibia helping uh, people basically during their cloud transformation journeys. So that's kind of uh, me in a nutshell. So about today, um, basically we're gonna talk about um, cloud native, actually what it is cloud native, what it means in the context of the stock. And then we'll go through the newest addition to the OWASP top 10s. They're making it really a uh, handful to, to talk about it. So uh, I shorten it to OWASP CNAS later down the line. So for the Dutch people. <laughs> so uh, quick disclaimer. So I'll mention a bunch of tools. Uh, most of them I try to uh, stick to open source stuff also for the crowd, but there are some solutions uh, that some names that might have escaped try to filter, so I do not endorse any specific tool or solution. Please make sure that you do your own research. Is it applicable to your own context? And those lists by, are by all means not extensive and exhaustive. So there is way more stuff and more, st more and more stuff is coming. So, um, quick tangent on the way here. I actually learned that the biggest black hole we know of is the mass of 66 billion suns. And it's apparent, there's apparently an upper limit for black holes, so they can only grow to a certain size. So we might actually have huge, huge black holes floating around in space that we cannot see because they exhaust all the energy around them and suck in the accretion disk. And yeah, they're, not, they're, they're just invisible to us. So I learned this on the way here, <laughs> so I dropped it in. Now you know as well. So, <laughs> so um, cloud native. Um, going back, coming back to Earth, uh, between Earth and space, so cloud native, our clouds. So, uh, you know, this, is, this has been, uh, it's relatively hard to define. There's multiple definitions floating around on the internet, but uh, my favorite one, and the one I think resonates with the most people, hopefully, this is the official definition from the CNCF, that's the Cloud Native Foundation. So, loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, observable, and that help us basically to do, make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toil. So that's kind of the idea behind cloud native. So we can do our work as fast as possible and actually do the fun things rather than do the uh, toil and, and heavy lifting and you know, operational burden and fight fires uh, rather than build new things. Me, sorry. <laughs> I know why it popped up. Sorry, for that. I need to turn it off. Disable. Yes, there. Now we should be fine. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, so, 
going back to CNCF, so if anybody, if you visit this website, you'll see this gigantic panel of cloud native. This is, we're talking about hundreds, I think we're getting into a good few hundred solutions. Uh, most of them are open source uh, and they are designed to run basically as cloud native applications, fulfilling one or the other requirement, uh, tackling one or another challenge uh, basically that we might have in developing our applications or running our business. So the ideal scenario, you would be able to go there, pick something, drop it in and start using. So, but with that basically comes, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So we do want to have it kind of under wraps and a bit under control uh, of what should we do? What could we do in the, uh, in a, with these solutions? So a bit more uh, about cloud native. I think a lot of you can relate to this setup, this diagram, where we have a very nice front end. We have a web app, uh, an API maybe. There's this giant core and there's one big database behind it. So the transition, the quite, the quite frequent transition is to this model basically, which means we're, and this is also the model I'm going to refer to during the uh, later uh, slides in this presentation, and this is part of the cloud native, uh, uh, basically what cloud native means for the sakes of this presentation. So the underlying evolution of the infrastructure on the, of our infrastructure allowed us to basically cut up our bits, uh, cut up our application into smaller bits, so the microservices uh, basically that communicate possibly via an event bus, you might be using push-pull events, uh, you must be using some direct service-to-service -service communication. So basically we add all these arrows uh, effectively where something happens between the services one way or another. And these effectively create a bigger attack surface. So if we move on, so cloud native is also more. So we, the previous slide was mentioning the microservices. So now we also involve the pipelines. So the way we deploy things, the way we actually, uh, you know, handle things during the deployment process, uh, the way we test, the way we build. Uh, this is uh, the way the platform itself is created and deployed and provided all the processes around it. And uh, right now we're in a stage where containers are the primary means of delivering uh, the application and code to the platform. The next step we're going towards is effectively the function of the ser a function as a service where we will totally eliminate containers and we will be dropping really just the put blank the, the raw code into 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 a well sort of container that from our perspective will be just the, we put our code in a box and it just runs. So yeah, as you can see, the landscape is quite big and the definition is quite extensive. So there are multiple points where something uh, can go wrong. And this is a whole process that, uh, you know, uh, going, the, going towards cloud native is a journey. Doesn't matter if you're just starting, doesn't matter if you're already, you know, there. This is a perfectly continuous process. This is a pretty good uh, trail map that shows you that gives you an idea on actually how much is involved. Uh, this is also yeah, created by CNCF, so this is very community driven and this is people have run into this. So if you're at any stage of this, uh, do have a look. This should give you a good idea on where you might be at, what you might be missing on the like strategic level. How do we move towards cloud native? Now, uh, looking a bit more at the um, tactical level, uh, operational, here comes the OASP CNAS. This is a community driven project like uh, all of the OASP projects. This is uh, relatively new. I think the first commit to this was in 21 July. So we're talking about a year and a bit basically. And this is a collection of challenges that the community has seen over the last few years. And the most common issues like with most OASP top 10 lists in uh, in order of severity or in order of occurrence. So the most common issues are first, doesn't mean they're not, they, 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 they are immediately also most important. So, um, and we, 
the goal is also to uh, provide us with uh, a realization that we need a new approach to how we deal with cloud native. Because as I mentioned previously, cloud native is about the bigger picture. So the application, the platform, you effectively do a whole to whole, almost a full end to end uh, service basically where you have to look at everything. So the cloud native uh, application security top 10 is aimed towards providing you with some steps on how to tackle the most prevalent issues that the community sees. Okay, so starting with um, insecure, uh, starting with number one, so this is the insecure cloud and container orchestration and configuration. So how we will go from there, there will be a challenge. Um, basically, there will be the, the one of the top 10 uh, mentioned and what I do here is I will provide a action that in my opinion is a good starting point, but it does not have to be necessarily for you. This is basically something to start thinking about and start looking at effectively. And in the end, the goal is uh, like with a lot of the uh, OWASP top 10 lists where you have a black this blacklist, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. This one is slightly different, at least for now, where it's more like, okay, look at the things, uh, what you want to do actually. So they were trying to turn it around uh, basically in more of a whitelist approach than a blacklist approach because the blacklist is continuously reinvented because people will find different ways of bypassing the blacklist. So it's, it's less work in the shorter term, but in the longer term, you inv have to invest way more time to design a proper blacklist. So actually saying, okay, I want this is much simpler long term and requires much less work. Initially, it's probably way more work, but uh, long term, you get way more benefits from creating whitelists. So in case of uh, insecure uh, cloud and container orchestration and configuration, my choice was for baselines. So figure out your desire, figure out this is what I want. So there are certain things that can help you with it. I'm uh, uh, sure most of you are familiar with the SIS uh, baselines. So these are basically uh, good industry standards developed over the years, also community driven. So it's not somebody sitting somewhere, five people deciding, oh, this is how you should do things. This is really community driven. So it's a very good source for uh, a framework because the, that baseline they have might not be fully applicable to you. So you can toggle all the, flip all the switches and okay, this is what we actually want. So once you have the whitelist, then you have to actually check for it. So in case of cloud native applications, uh, you, there's, multiple, uh, there's multiple solutions that check against those baselines, allow you to whitelist, allow you to report and give you the ability to non-intrusively interact with the deployments, uh, with when the developer is writing the code, when the platform engineers are writing the infrastructure as code, give you the ability to give them feedback almost instantly. Okay, this does not meet our standards. This does not meet our baseline. So you need to have a look at that. Moving on, uh, our favorite injection flows. I think these have been forever on the OS top 10 list, so nothing changed. This is again that overlap with the application. Whoop. Yes, geez, everything. Sorry for that. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Don't. Uh, oh my God, these are all these things. <laughs> Disable. Let's see. So, uh, yeah, going back to injection flows. What is interesting, this still refers to our good old application in OWASP top 10, so I'm going to bore you with uh, that, but uh, input validation in this case is one of the uh, approaches, uh, approaches to handle that. And I will do, allow myself the liberty of going back a bit to our model here, <coughs> where actually, uh, you know, we have very nice uh, front end, all the injection flows coming, uh, all, the, all the injection attempts might be coming from the front, but there's another point, which is the event pass, because now we're passing messages between actual microservices, 
And effectively, that when we broke up our monolith into separate services, the messages have to still be processed. So it might turn out there's a whole chain of events that the message is being processed, and there might be an injection flaw, two or three, basically, services down the line, where, where the information might be passed along, 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 and it, then it's going to hit. So the attack surface basically grows exponentially effectively with every single service that you allow to interact. So this is basically a kind of a new thing where in the old monolith you kind of could keep everything nicely in one box, you passed things between functions, so you had a better overview of that. Right now, if you have, if you have a team handling each of those services, then they have to communicate. Then they have to basically cross-pollinate cross each other, talk to each other, and you know, figure out, okay, this, is, this generates extra load, of course, and this generates mainly extra uh, effort and a larger attack surface. So moving on again. So we have baselines. Yeah, we have our favorite injection flaws. So uh, good old OWASP uh, cheat sheet. Um, uh, basically for the usual stuff and for the um, backend injection, uh, for the input validation for uh, the backend things or for the message bus, uh, my advice would be to try to detach basically the user data from the inputs themselves. So the services can identify this is the user data, so I know this is untrusted, and these are actually the commands, so something like uh, uh, pre-made statements uh, for databases where you basically do not mix, you pass this data separately, and then it's basically combined at the end. Uh, uh, to So your uh, prepared statement is basically not processed by the database as a whole in the end while using two channels. So, next thing is improper authentication authorization. So here we're looking really at um, Authentication authorization starting from the infrastructure to the application, uh, to cloud IAM, to uh, privileges, roles basically. These things are hard, especially if you need to go fast during development, everybody has admin uh, basically because yeah, we need to do this, we need to do that, uh, and we need to keep moving forward and you know, people do not want to slow down. So um, the applications don't perform or Perform, uh, do not perform properly authentication or authorization checks, uh, especially on resource access. So again, we look at the back end, and again, there's another of access versus that we have. We, we lock in everything on the front, and in the back, yeah, everything kind of talks to each other because we're like, oh, we're already past the wall, so yeah. That's that kind of weird fourth analogy where we do have to still look at multiple layers of security. So we can still uh, basically have proper control. Uh, we can look at over permissive cloud IAM roles, again, the admin thing. Uh, lack of orchestrator node, basically trust. This still happens, unfortunately, especially in cloud native, if you do have, if you run your own implementations of Kubernetes. There are certain defaults that allow people basically to just attach a random node to your cluster. So also have something to uh, be careful of. And for this, the good old least privilege. So uh, basically, this really doesn't change. <laughs> it, is, it is hard. One approach I found working was reverse engineering roles, which means uh, in your staging, preferably environment where the application is relatively stable and you do like your pre-deployment checks, you can monitor which API calls are being done to the cloud, to basically to all the services. And based on those API calls, you can get the exact methods the application needs and exact permissions. And based on that, you can create a custom role, uh, basically when deploying, uh, either to uh, all the big free cloud providers or to your also internal uh, services. Because, and if you are able to automate that process, that means every single time a new feature might be added in staging, the role gets reverse engineered and added to production with the permissions that are only necessary for the application to run. So, um, all the free uh, cloud providers do have some sort of analysis capabilities where they can provide you insights. Uh, a longer term usage also results in like recommendations. Okay, this role is too much. You're not using these permissions. So, that's also very useful. There are built-in me mechanisms for that. Uh, have a look, uh, basically play around with it. I do believe all of them are basically free. 
So they're built in, uh, so uh, you improve your uh, security posture. Right, uh, the next time, the next thing is uh, pipelines and software supply chain flaws. Um, SolarWinds, anyone? <laughs> Basically, uh, so this is uh, about the way we deploy uh, our applications, our infrastructure and everything around that effectively. So, um, there might be multiple things, so you could use untrusted images, insufficient authentication on the pipeline itself, or again, once you're, you see the pipeline, you're like assumed, oh, everybody's fine, we don't have, we don't have to do any additional checks. Uh, there might be overly permissive uh, uh, roles, again, on the registry itself, so where you push your artifacts, people might have too much privilege uh, one way or another. So. And the goal here is not to focus only on the application, basically, but on the whole chain, again, end to end. So from the moment the developers start writing code to the moment the application is actually exposed to you, to be used. So uh, for me here is base image control, basically. So know the base artifacts that you are using, uh, be it container images, be it libraries, uh, in most cases, there are uh, good solutions that can play that intermediate role where you can pull artifacts from the outside and then basically expose only the necessary uh, internals uh, to the internal repository. So the developers also have to go through a process where in development, they might have more freedom. They can still push stuff from the outside. But once you, let's say, start building from staging, the builders from stage can only reach into internal repositories where you have then full control and you have the ability to look at uh, the packages that actually come in. So, uh, you know, trust but verify effectively. Principle where, where you double check actually what's happening from the outside. And ba based on that, you can then adjust the speed of uh, updating of the packages uh, from the outside. Um, one thing uh, that can be used potentially, especially if you're running on Kubernetes, like I mentioned, uh, at the start is that uh, Kubernetes already has uh, built-in mechanisms uh, that allow you to do some checks, for instance, that the base image, uh, you know, cannot come, must come from a trusted repository. So there are built-in mechanisms already that allow you to write policies where things might not be, uh, you want to block things uh, or at least alert on things if, they're don't, if they do not meet your baseline again. Right, uh, so container registries, uh, especially for cloud providers, everywhere, uh, they have them, they're uh, available. So you can use those to be that man in the middle, basically, for, for your needs and uh, to uh, store the base images and then use those to pull and build your application containers. Right, insecure secret storage, uh, this is basically, yeah. Uh, application secrets handed publicly, publicly and um, you know can be exported. Uh, orchestrator store uh, secrets are stored unencrypted. Uh, you know encoding is not uh, encryption. Kubernetes encodes the secrets, but they're not actually properly encrypted. Encrypted, so everything in etcd is is basically <laughs> exposed. So uh, API keys, passwords uh, stored next to applications. Uh, you know hard coded application secrets. There might be certain scenarios where for legacy reasons or you're during the transition, you have to have these things in place. Basically, there's no other, you know, no really going around that. So uh, my first choice of action would be encrypto secrets. And then you can decrypt them on the fly. That logic can be relatively easily added where uh, by using uh, sidecar mechanisms in Kubernetes, you can pass on encrypted data that's gonna be decrypted on the fly, injected into the application. And then even if you have to store the secrets next to the application for whatever reason, because it's necessary legacy, as I said, might be, at least it's stored. So if it does leak out, it leaks out encrypted. So a uh, very interesting project, if you haven't heard about it, that's run by uh, two ex-colleagues of mine. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to have a look. This is about, yeah, what not to do, how not to store secrets, especially uh, within Kubernetes. And there are some exercises also uh, 
for individual clouds. So what actually can happen if you mismanage your secrets and how they can uh, possibly leak out. So moving on. Uh, so uh, over permissive and network security policies. This is again, this is the whole, we're past the wall, we're safe on the inside. Um, Again, we trust our event bus, but the information that might be passing between the event bus also might be untrustworthy. So my, uh, my actually approach to this is egress control, which is, I think, often forgotten. So does your application actually need 100% access to the internet going back? So do, does it need to be able to do initiate outbound connections? Because if it's a let's say, SaaS application where people reach out to you, they initiate the connection, but does the application actually need to go? If it does, okay, there is a valid business need, but if it doesn't, maybe you only need certain endpoints. So create a whitelist, basically, uh, based on that, and either on the edge or internally, there's two projects that can do internal network control called Calico and uh, Cilium that can help you write, basically, policies, uh, network policies for uh, for Kubernetes and control the traffic. So this is, this is a very interesting, wherever I mention it, people are like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's actually a pretty valid point. Do you actually control? Do you know what your application is sending outside? Do you know if it's initiating connections to the outside? Because just simply by doing this, you can ex limit, limit the uh, attack surface extremely because the attacker will once, if they, if they, if they, even if they land, they don't have a way to get out basically, so they kind of are stuck. And you can then also monitor the outgoing connections, basically, oh, something's trying to start a connection to the outside, and yeah, you know your application doesn't do it. So that's already a aha moment. So very worthwhile uh, spending some time uh, looking at, at uh, egress <coughs> control. Uh, so uh, using components with known vulnerabilities, so this is, uh, usually caused by legacy stuff again. This has been running a library. The guy in Nebraska, uh, living in Nebraska, stopped supporting this library, uh, basically. And yeah, but we still are using it. We still have it in production. So there's nothing really we can do. There's no alternative right now. There are known vulnerabilities, basically. So in this case, uh, my idea to start with is soft simply software composition analysis. So know what you have know where it is because if you know what you have and you know where it is then you can put some mitigations in place because even though you know the library might have a huge you know 10.0 vulnerability cv vulnerability you might be able to put something in front because there's a very specific way this has to be exploited so you can view that you can track it you can protect the application if you know where it is but if you don't know you have it then then you don't know you have it um, I refer to, I don't know if a lot of you had to do something with log4j, but <laughs> so trying to find that thing where it actually lives is already, if, if, if you had that, it was already like a huge step, just simply knowing what you have. So, okay, the next one. So general improper asset management, this is more on the infrastructure side where it's like shadow IT, people spinning up random stuff. Okay. So, uh, so basically people uh, spinning up random stuff uh, on, on, the, on the cloud because it's easy, because it's nice and easy to click through basically, because we want to just, oh, we're just going to test something, right? We need to just run this, run this. And things simply disappear off the radar and you might have uh, instances that are directly attached, uh, you know, databases exposed to the internet uh, during testing and then they're not, uh, you don't get rid of them. So this, yeah, simply comes down to uh, asset inventory. So uh, there are free open source projects that do a, a very good job where they can build a database effective, almost like an SQL-like database. You can use SQL-like queries to look at what you have in your cloud. It effectively scans your cloud, scans all the APIs, looks at all the resources. So this is easy to do it on an almost continuous basis. So you can see if new things pop up uh, and alert, remediate. There's then different follow-up actions where you can kill stuff. You can trigger Lambda functions on AWS to so kill the, the thing that popped up because it's not properly 
uh, basically a setup or it doesn't, uh, uh, it's not within your, again, baseline. So uh, there's built-in functionality on all the clouds. So it's AWS config. This is the, the Azure resource manager and Google has an asset inventory as well. So they do have these services that help you keep track of what's actually coming up, what's actually coming down, what are your active resources. So these are, a, these are basically the cloud native tools, but they are a bit more cumbersome overall. So I think uh, basically starting with uh, one of these three is a very good idea to see, okay, just run it against your cloud, see how things look basically. And okay, uh, yeah, this is a very interesting one where we have the cloud, so ooh, we have all the resources in the world. And we forget to limit those. So there's, uh, there have been several incidents in the past where simply the attacker uh, jumped on the box and they were able to start crypto mining effectively with, over the weekend because there wasn't sufficient, proper, sufficient monitoring. <laughs> And over the weekend, they cost seven digit basically bills on, cl on the cloud environment. So, <laughs> or uh, simply, yeah, a, even a financial DDoS, where if you do not constrain or put limits or quotas, the attacker can slowly trickle traffic towards your applications, which are set to auto scaling for a reason. So you can actually keep up and you'll slowly get loaded, loaded, loaded. And uh, a smart attacker basically can really bring up that fake traffic to a point where, yeah, you'll be racking up a bill, but nothing's really happening. So these are, these are also uh, very interesting uh, approaches uh, at, uh, attackers take uh, to basically just exhaust your resources, not necessarily just compute, but your financial resources. Um, so in this case, uh, yeah, request limits and quotas. Uh, Kubernetes as an orchestrator, this is also Nomad uh, from HashiCorp. They do have capabilities to uh, define these, basically, request limits and quotas. So uh, in case of Kubernetes, request would be how much a contain single container can uh, request from the orchestrator from the node, limits would be what's the hard limit, this is okay, the co a single container cannot request more than this, and quotas is effectively for the whole node, this is how much resources a whole node can allocate to the uh, deployments within it. So uh, you might notice the open policy agent as a gatekeeper, so you can use it to scan the manifest before deployment, and you can say, yeah, you have to have these resource quotas, uh, limits, uh, requests defined within your manifest to be able to deploy in the first place. And you can immediately, you can even start at during that uh, development and staging. So it kind of becomes a habit where people actually think, okay, how much does the application actually need as far as resources are concerned? So there are ways of enforcing or at least detecting if something is not uh, meeting your own requirements. And last not but least is uh, effective logging and monitoring. So this is something uh, basically that uh, the community felt also comes up quite frequently as it made the top 10 list. So yeah, here we're really talking about, you know, uh, attackers taking uh, advantage of poor monitoring where they can slowly, as I said, basically in the previous example, uh, slowly start to s uh, scale up your cluster and you don't even notice because you, you, you basically, yeah, it just scales up. So you assume this is basically the fake traffic is actually real traffic and you don't, don't have the right tools or the right channels to actually see how much of this, uh, how, how is it happening, what's exactly happening bef behind the scenes. So for me, the first step would be to, um, have a look, generally speaking, at observability. Uh, because first, in order to monitor something, you have to have some sort of ability to generate metrics, basically. So this is, this is, this is uh, a topic that's been recently, over the last year, very near and dear to my heart. So, uh, mm, I, well, uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with eBPF. Uh, this has been in uh, the Linux kernel since 2014, I believe. Uh, and it gives us really an ability to modify the kernel on the fly. Sh long story short, I could uh, talk about it <laughs> for a longer time. But yeah, uh, this did not really get traction until we got the whole, basically until the whole Kubernetes wave started. Because there was no really no 
valid reason to do it because we had things like AppArmor, App SE Linux, which basically were nice for a single host running one thing. You could set it up, they were maybe not perfect, but this is what people knew, so why do we want to you know, reinvent something else again and try again? So VPF was mainly focused on like micro, micro patches, basically on the fly you could patch the kernel, invent new stuff. So why it gained traction is because of the architecture of conta how containers basically uh, run. So you have the kernel and the containers run in with X effectively within the uh, orchestrator's kernel. So if you have a thousand containers, just by looking at the kernel of the, of the node, you can actually see what's happening within all of those containers. So you don't have to deploy a thousand agents. You simply plug into the kernel of the host and that gives you the ability to see every single system call that's basically done within the container. And that brings, opens up a whole new world of opportunities, basically, and gives you the ability to actually see things properly, see what is happening and react on it, maybe even proactively protect. You might say, oh, my container only runs this binary with this, basically, conditions. This is the only thing that can be run in the container. If something else tries to do a system call, just block it. So you can basically create things based on whitelisting for containers. A few interesting projects, uh, Falco, Tetragon, ThreatMapper, and Pixie. This, is, this one is more of a, like a tracing operational, but an extremely useful tool to show basically handle performance-based uh, <coughs> metrics. So that brings me almost uh, yeah, to, uh, to the final uh, slide. So, the idea is we are actually running, starting to, again, going a big circle, running into problems that we had, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago when, you know, big networking started. So we're re really, again, going back like a, call, uh, like a previous presenter of mine did uh, post-quantum. We're trying to reinvent crypto, basically. So we're trying to reinvent solutions where we put in so many layers on top of each other, where we lose, uh, basically, touch with, with the actual underlying infrastructure. So I would uh, invite everybody to think outside the box and basically have a look from a different perspective. And uh, because, yeah, we need new approaches uh, for this new way of working. So, and yeah, that's going to be it for me. Thank, Thank you, you, Philip. <laughs> So we're already a little bit in uh, break yeah, time. Yeah, no but, uh, <laughs> Sorry for are that. There any questions for Philip? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time.